Okay, can we, can we, can we, can we, can we please talk about drones? Welcome back to another roundtable on the Photo Focus podcast for April 2023. This episode is droning on and on. As always, I'm here with my co-host, Rob Moroto from up there in the Great White North. This month, we also have joining us, Dave Wilson is coming back. He's from Texas, he wants me to say via Scotland. And uh, for the first time, Drew Armstrong, he was from Utah, and I was calling it mostly Utah. But we're going to get to know them throughout the next, oh, probably an hour or so. First, let me bring in my co-host, Rob Moroto. How's it going up there in the formerly Great White North? Ah, it's doing all right here, Pep. It's uh, it's warmer. It's better. It, the snow is starting to melt, I think. I hope. Ah. I hope it's going to go away. But who knows, we can't right? Call, can't uh. call it the Great White North anymore. Well, hey, no. we, um, we have a... I think we're going to have one of those episodes where we have to at some point say dude guys we got to stop because we're gonna we have four talkers here uh that i and this uh, is one of the topics that we've been wanting to do for a long time is talking about stuff that we don't really know much about and drones are definitely a hot a hot topic and we know nothing much about it so this is great for us to learn as well so if you're out there saying ron and rob have too much of the similar experience need to expand a bit here we go so we're going, we're going to um, get into that in just a second. First, let's thank uh, Photomatics, our sponsor for high dynamic range photography. Uh, version 7 is out and in the wild now. And uh, boy, what do we want to say about that, Rob? We are both heavy users and um, definitely for... Definitely. I, if I was addicted to one thing, it would be Photomatics. I would be... Uh, <laughs> I would be remiss <laughs> to say otherwise. And so, yes, highly recommend Photomatics. And even I teach how to use Photomatics in my online course that was just released in January. And, you know, I've had nothing but great feedback about people's experience with Photomatics. They're saying it's easy, it's straightforward, it's, uh, and the results are fantastic. And obviously, with uh, the way that we do it, it's perfect every time. So, yeah. Photomatics, one of the best, one of the best things, one of the best things about products like that is having someone walk you through it for the first time. You can go, oh, there we go, and, and you move on. Instead of uh, what happens to me a lot is you get a, a new product, whether it's software or not, and you got to figure out how to use it. So check out Rob's <laughs> course. Uh, check out hdrsoft.com for quite a bit of uh, material that helps uh, learn how to use it. I've helped with some of that. You can contact either of us if you have questions too. All right. But like I say, we want to move into our show uh, quickly. We're going to talk a little bit about um, backups, a little bit about what we're hoping to do as far as conferences and photographic things coming up. And then we're going to dive into our main topic, which is uh, aerial photography, which these days mostly means drones. And to help us do that, guys, thanks for letting us go through intros real (laughs) as quickly as we could so we could get into the meat of this. Um, To help us do that, Let's start with our returning guest, Dave Wilson, um, who is going to represent our mostly amateur aerial photographer, but has a lot of experience uh, based on what I've, well, what you and I have talked about, but also on the results that you can see on Dave's website. Check the show notes. How's it going, Dave? (laughs) Welcome in. It's great. Thanks for having me back. It's nice to be here. Yeah, I should, let me just mention that one of my early podcast experiences was on a show with you what, what was the show called it's not going That's right anymore. photo net photo netcast we ran that show photo for netcast. gosh seven or eight years at least i think yeah, yeah. that was really that fun was when i was fun. just yeah. discovering this this medium and i was getting yeah. into photo focus and other ones and you asked me on and that was a good experience i think and the first also time um, we met, in fact was a uh photo netcast mm-hmm. photo walk in san francisco wasn't it it was definitely a photo walk in san francisco ago. Yep. That was, that was great. We, that included um, Dave educating someone when they told us we couldn't take photos of their building and he went, Oh no, <laughs> we're not. No, we're, we, and so he, yes. he's, it's that endeared me in, how does that, how does the oh. saying go endeared you to me right away? Oh. Plus um, we ended the day with beer. So that's right. And, and as I recall, All I had to, things. yeah, as I, as I recall, I, I was disappointed that I had to, go to something that night and I couldn't have more beer. So, <laughs> so, uh, Hey, uh, Drew Armstrong, welcome. Um, thank we, you. 
have also uh, a guy that shoots a ton, which these days is by itself is uh, very something I respect. And he's going to represent our uh, quite professional drone uh, photographer. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't make a living with that specifically, but uh, I sure love doing it. And um, I, I've been looking at Dave's stuff. You, you do a fantastic job yourself. I'm amazing, yeah. oh, amazing photography. Yeah. I like that. yours better, like, but then again, maybe that's the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got, you've got better state capital to shoot locally, I guess. Well, I, I, I'm looking at one that looks like, is that Austin where it's looking through all the buildings up to the state capitol? That's a yeah. beautiful shot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We, we always want to have on the show better photographers than me. That's, that's my rule. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Um, so let, yeah, I, I check out uh, anybody listening um, in the show notes. We'll have uh, links to both um, well, everybody's websites, but our guests um, check out Dave Wilson, photography.com. And then um, Drew yours is a uh, Drew Armstrong, Drew, excuse me, Drew Armstrong.com. Yep. And I guess Dave Wilson, your name is a little bit more normal. Well, no, you didn't, you weren't in time to get just Dave Wilson.com. Uh, I don't think so. It's a nursery in somewhere in California has mm -hmm. that one, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, so um, yeah, check out their websites because it's true. Uh, the work speaks for itself. And the other reason I brought up how that you're representing our professional is that you were mentioning, we talked a bit before the show yesterday and uh, you showed me some new equipment that you're looking at that holds a professional camera. Let's hold on to that for when we talk about drones. Sure. But that's one of the reasons is getting a real professional DSLR up there. Let's start out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's an organic show. We kind of get to know uh, listeners are going to get to know everyone as we go. Let, and to that, to the, for that reason, let's start out with, you know, a lot of times you get on a show and we kind of talk about what, Hey, what you've been doing, but let's put that in the context of, of uh, events and conferences. Are you guys going uh, to anything coming up? Uh, maybe let's go backward here and start with Drew. Yeah, Sorry, absolutely. <laughs> um, th th there's a couple of conferences that I like that are held here in Utah. Utah's a great place to to be a photographer. Photographer's paradise. And, yeah. Um, yeah, one of them is uh, is one that's held. Actually, both of these are held in Kanab right now. Um, we have, you know, a lot of times they'll do out of Moab or something like that here as well. But uh this time I'm going to one um, next month that's called the Nightscaper Conference. And I think this is the fourth mm -hmm. year, third or fourth year that they've done it. And it mostly focuses on Milky Way, a little deep sky. And they call it nightscaping because you're kind of doing a landscape shot, but with the, with the Milky Way over it. So, you, you know, figure out some either starlight or low level lighting or, or, uh, you know, it, it, which is a kind of like light painting, but it's a little different um, where where you actually look at it, something lights the the amb ambient light, maybe um, lights the landscape up and then you you keep it dark enough still that you're not over competing with the uh, with the stars. And so I like to do a lot of Milky Way stuff and we're going to come. Um, the conference is three days uh, at kind of I think it starts on the. 17th or 18th of uh, May, and we're going to be out there starting on the 14th and going till the 21st or 22nd. And I've got friends coming from all over the country, and there's going to be about six of us that pal around and go camping and and uh, stay up all night like crazy people. Yeah, it sounds like one of those hunting trips that you hear about. <laughs> it, it, it is. We've done this several times, and boy, th there's a there's sure a lack of sleep. That's for sure. But uh, this year, uh, we're going to make a special effort not to get drowned in a slot canyon. Um, Utah has <laughs> two to three hundred percent of our normal snowfall this year, which is a really good thing. So we don't all get killed by the toxic lake dust. But uh, it, it it it's going to be a crazy year. We've have more snow than we did in 1982 and 83 when i spent all my like literally sandbagged filled sandbags when i was a 14 year old like six nights a week for a month straight so huh. it, it's worse than that this year so we'll see how it goes oh, dear <laughs> lord hey dave is uh what's the name of the 
South by Southwest. What is it called? North by Northwest. No, uh, North yeah, by I'm sitting here feeling really jealous of Drew because I haven't been to Utah since, well, I guess it was last November. But wow. yeah, I'm a member of a group called North by Northwest and we do expeditions to various places. And uh, we try and go somewhere different, except for the fact that in the last 12 years, we've been to Utah three times. So well, uh, it's absolutely my favorite place. You're smart. Yeah. <laughs> and the drone, the drone restrictions are nice and light there as well, which is great. Um, I spent some time outside Hanksville, uh, and there's so many amazing locations there. Uh, I, and it's a perfect place for drone photography. The, the, the aerial views are stunning. Um, and yeah, even the like you fly in the map, there's state great. parks. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. Most, Love it. Yeah, Utah state parks um, regulate drones the way that drones should be regulated in mm-hmm. national parks. So... Yeah, uh, it, it's per park, and uh, almost all of them figure out a way to do at least some accommodation. So, mm-hmm. hmm. yeah, we were in Goblin uh, Goblin Valley State Park, and it's you pay five bucks extra, ten bucks extra, or something for a license, and you can fly there. Yep, and, uh, and it, was it gives you the park specific rules on the back of it, yep. so you can't say I didn't mm-hmm. know any better, and mm-hmm. and you're good to go. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty sensible. But aside from that, I've been talking about conferences and events and things. I'm afraid I have nothing photographically exciting um, conference-wise going on just now. Most of my life is involved with uh, mentoring our school robotics team right now. It's robotics competition season. But I do do some photography there and I actually cover some of their competition events as the photographer for the event while the kids are driving around doing the robot thing. So that's been my photography recently, I'm afraid. I'm all for all the the volunteering I've, I've gotten better at things by doing those kind those kinds of things and as a matter of oh. fact this year we had uh we had the uh, one of the best one of the best football players on my son's high school team is also like the captain of the robotics team too so he's like the <laughs> best of both worlds the brain and the and the athlete he's a huge lineman <laughs> so he's, hey uh rob yeah. you guys you got anything you, you getting out or doing anything local no. or what's your plan no. Honestly, I've just been uh, working on this course, uh, working, you know, doing a little bit of mentoring here and there, some coaching, and then I just, uh, I got a, I got asked to shoot uh, a, an elementary school, and I, I have to stop saying shoot in elementary school because if right. I ever get pulled over <laughs> by a cop saying where are you going, I'm gonna go shoot in elementary <laughs> school, I'm gonna just. Yeah end up in a whole lot of pain but no it's um, a new there life, was a yeah. right and so i went to go photograph a, a school of school community slash event and uh we're just waiting for all the 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 parental approvals to let photos be released and all that stuff so it's a lot more work than i actually anticipated but oh well, it's always of, good kind of... to help so you'll, you'll learn something from it anyway do you know good. john mcbride who's with Autel now uh, no, I don't. Oh, yeah. John McBride was with uh, Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems. He's a fellow Utah here. They call him Drone Jesus a lot of times because he kind of looks like that. But he's one of the one of the main guys with Autel now, and he w- really does a lot with uh, um, local uh, robotics teams with the high schools. So that's cool. Oh, it's a, it's a big deal. There's thousands of teams in the country. You're talking about getting clearance from parents, though. One of the good things about shooting the robotics events is they all have large posters outside saying, by entering this facility, you give approval yeah. to have your likeness used, blah, blah, blah. So there's no problem with uh, releases and that kind of thing. Yeah. It makes life a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Now, the next one that I shoot, if there's, I, I actually want to just put a stand outside with headbands and say, if you don't want your picture taken, please wear this red headband. <laughs> just <laughs> make it easy <laughs> yeah. anyways like we should get into these uh topics here and yep. okay so ron i'm seeing this it says drobo and backup what the heck's a drobo a drobo well you know what <laughs> before i let before i let you guys uh go on about the drobo experience i've been using a drobo ever since it was heavily promoted on podcasts and mm-hmm. everyone was talking about how great the Drobo was and was it Alex? uh, um, But what's a Drobo? Okay. It's a backup, (laughs) backup drive. (laughs) Sorry. A backup drive that actually is pretty awesome in, in theory. It, uh, you, you, you buy, um, bear drives, not like a grizzly bear, but 
like naked drives that you can put into any computer. And it comes with a bunch mm -hmm. of slots. Like I had one that was five and you just load them up with whatever size bare drives you want. And it treats it from your point of view as a single drive. So it, it you use it as a backup. So it's like a NAS. No, well, almost. It's yeah. A, yeah. But it's like, uh, it's but it, it had, it had a, it had a, the unique thing was um, it had its own way of doing things. And if one drive failed, then you just replace it. And it would use all of the spread out data from the other drives to replace the one. So it wasn't like a one-to-one -one backup. So it, it had a, it had a whole kind of a ingenious uh, new way of doing things. And uh, I had a, I had a, a couple of drives fail and I replaced them and it, it took a while, but it did recover it and everything was fine. Um, so that's, and it was very popular with photographers and videographers, I would say. And um uh, now, <laughs> uh, seems like they've had a little bit of a troubled past, I know, and they did go ahead and announce bankruptcy last summer, if I'm understanding that right. And they're, and then we'll ask, uh, maybe I'll ask Drew, you, what you said was that you found that they are uh, stopping operations coming up. Is that right? Yeah, um, I was right in the middle of a little problem with them. And I have a, a, a five bay and an eight bay that I was using at the same time. And uh, so I was trying to work through in January a, a problem where I wasn't getting the five bay to mount um, the volumes. And so I, I have, a, you know, five year service plan for both of the drives. And so I'd call them up and they've always been really good. What happened is about three years ago, Drobo got sold to a company called store centric. And, yeah. uh, ever since then it hasn't been great. And, uh, and, but I usually could get help. And then all of a sudden nobody is answering the phone or answering emails or anything. And I'm like, wait a second, I paid for this. But, uh, I, you know, that was the that was the end of the line for me. And I said, you know, I've got to get this information off of there. And so I figured out a, a different solution. And it's interesting because Dave and I are both using um, the same solution. I, I use a uh, mm -hmm. uh, the OWC Thunder Bays, which require a software. Uh, uh, what's it called a uh, uh, software that you use uh, that's called like a driver like a driver yeah it's a, it's called soft raid and and they actually purchased soft raid to do it and you can do raid 5 with it as well so that you have redundancy and you can either have a two drive or one drive redundancy within these boxes but the the problem um with, with this versus drobo is with Drobo, you could just buy the next size up drive that got cheap, and now you just pop yeah. in the new one, and you could keep saying, okay, now, yeah, I started out, and they're all two two gig or two terabyte drives, and then you know one of them goes bad, and you could pop in a five or a six terabyte and, and just work your way up and use a whole mix of different ones with, with these other solutions in order to get the RAID to work properly. They all have to be the same size. And, and at least with OWC that you can do Toshiba drives and, you know, an Exos drive and a WD, you know, black or red or whatever, and you can mix them, but they have to be the same size or defaults to the smaller size of whatever drive you've got for all of the drives that are participating in the RAID volume. So, um, but here's, here's the thing is that they are not going to update the Drobo software that allows the dang thing to run with Max anymore, which means that right. any of you who are listening to this, if you update your computer with the next version of the OS that'll come out this coming fall, your Drobo won't work, even if it's in perfectly functioning sh shape hardware-wise, and the hardware worked before, if you update to the next version of the software, it's done. You're over and you won't be able to access your data anymore. Well, to be, so, to be fair about that, actually, yeah, the, war the warning should be that it, it may not because a lot of times they will still work with little updates, but at mm -hmm. any, at any time, because I, but there I, are what, what, what Apple is saying is Apple is saying this doesn't work it's not going to work in the near future. So there's a warning that pops up every now and again that says, 
this one is still not using code that's been updated. Oh, and now actually... that they're bankrupt, there's nobody to update that code. Yeah. So they've actually addressed it. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Apple said, look, uh, you know, beware, this one's going to go away. And, and, you know, obviously normally that's the warning for the software manufacturer to get on it and, and update their yeah. software. But if they're bankrupt and gone, we're just screwed. Exciting. And so I've, I've spent the last like three months copying data. So it's been mm -hmm. exciting. <laughs> you know, we had the same thing happen when Apple was switching over from, was it, they, they switched it from like 16 bit to 32 bit programming yeah. and anything that was 16 bit was no longer going to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's strange when you do such a fundamental change like that. Um, hey, it's for the, I'm sure it's for the better, but when it's, it is frustrating when our hardware that we rely on is all software based and. Once the company's gone, they're gone, and you can't well, remember do too. With we, that hardware anymore. We're we're pretty heavy users on all these things, so I always do, and I recommend that do not upgrade right away because there is inevitably always going to be some app, some application that didn't something breaks. Pre well, they didn't properly <laughs> prepare during because you know when when Mac or Windows is having an up an update coming the betas are available for these software companies and they'll, they'll get ready and they'll test and either some of them won't, or maybe they miss something, right? So if a new one comes out, there might be some changes. So I always wait at least to the point one update of just about anything. And especially my, if it's a, um, well, these days I pretty much work off one computer. So if I, so anyway, I might, in, if you're someone that has multiple computers, you might upgrade one, but don't count on it. You just don't know. Um, even I'm a, I'm kind of agnostic on Mac windows. I just highly prefer Mac, the inner, just the, the experience on it. But, uh, why, why I brought that up because I was going to make fun. We always make fun of windows for getting things wrong and Apple for getting things right. Even when Dave's not here, I still say that. And the, the, um, uh, so anyway, the point is you can't really trust them just to to watch out for every individual. And when we're kind of power users, we're going to break things or we're going to find things that aren't ready or whatever you want to call it. So I just I just wanted to, no matter what it is, firmware, operating systems, et cetera, just take your take a take, take a beat and wait for the first update. What do you think, Dave? Am I did I describe that? I okay. <laughs> Yeah, about the Drobo situation, I mean, obviously there's a whole lot of people affected by that. And I've got to wonder if there's enough uh, users out there who can shout loud enough to get them to do something like open sourcing the drivers. Get the source into the public well, domain and get people to maintain mean, it outside the company. Does this mean that it's not going to get picked up by anyone? Because uh, I, I know that you know? Dro Drobo themselves picked up some other product I used to use that was like an off-site backup situation. I can't think of the trans... Um, I can't remember now, but they picked it up and they supported that defunct business for a while, at least. And I took that signal to stop, to move on to something else. But uh, they even did that. I should also just tell my real quick Drobo story that at a, at a, at a conference, um, it was at the uh, Pinball Museum in Las Vegas, <laughs> where we had a a photo focus event. <laughs> so the, the Drobo, the new Drobo CEO was there that they had just recently purchased it. And I remember having this conversation with them about that. They didn't understand that they were responsible for people's, th this is my impression. It's like, you don't understand that you're responsible for people's data. The marketing you do is it's double backed up. It's trusted. It's et cetera. That's the marketing. And then you're going to say, well, if it breaks down, it's like a appliance. It, yeah. I mean, it can be covered if you have a plan like Drew has, but the, I just felt like the product that they have is some such that they have to take special care of how they treat mm -hmm. that part of it because it's not like a refrigerator. It's not like a camera that needs to get repaired. If something goes wrong, of course it does, but this is your data and your promise is that you have it double backed up. So that, that was a little bit, I felt, I felt like you didn't quite get it. There's another important yeah, thing to note here as well. You, you can't rely on a RAID system as your backup, your only backup. You think you've got that double redundancy there, but as you say, if the whole unit goes down or the controller board fries or something, you are still in big trouble. So make yeah, sure you have true. two totally independent solutions for your backup. 
Is that true? First of all, you're right. I, you have you have to have the offsite backup. But is that true that if uh, it does, you couldn't re take those drives and put it in a replacement unit or something? That does that not you, work that way? You yeah, kind Rob of thought WC, a... but I'm not sure if Drobo was the same. Rob, ahead, what Rob. I had to do you know, with mine is, uh, sorry, Rob. I, what I had to do with mine is is the reason I had to get the data off of the 8D, um, the Drobo that had the eight bays onto another OWC drive that I bought or, or uh, uh, Thunder Bay 8 was that I, I wasn't going to buy a new uh, five bay and that five bay drive just, you know, Drobo box wouldn't work, but I, I have done this before. And so I knew that if I could get all the data off of the 8D, which I did, then I could put the, the disc pack from the 5D3 into the 8D and it will work. It just mm. comes up and it just works. So, so even though the hardware has failed here and normally the, the, the warranty, the, the support would have replaced that box. Now they're gone. It won't. So I, at least I could get that off. And like last week, I finally, I mean, this is a three month process you know, I've got, and now at this point, because I had to do it to protect my data, to have that redundancy, because, you know, I mean, I have Backblaze too, but that it takes me, you know, nine months to back everything up onto Backblaze once I make a major change like this. And so I moved everything over onto the other, uh, the, the other one. Now I've got, I literally have like almost three quarters of a petabyte worth of storage here wow and i'm gonna have yeah. a lot of extra now but it, it <laughs> yeah i had to uh, you know no like so i had this i had an experience with uh my backup stuff because i used to have a nas and what i didn't understand about nas is is that it's still like you said it's like an appliance it's it it can break down and what I didn't realize was uh, if you have a NAS, don't put it into your furnace room because you think it's a good place to just hide it and it's out of the way. Because what happened was, well, all the dust got into the NAS. It's a furnace room. It's hot. It literally melted and melted the drives. And so by the time I get the warning, like, hmm, I can't access. All the drives were all melted. Everything was dead. <laughs> And nothing was recoverable because the hard drives themselves, along with an ass, melted. And so, Ouch. cautionary tale out there, if you have an ass, do not put it into your furnace room, even though it's going to be nice and convenient. Um, not a good place for it. Put it somewhere where it's dust-free, where it's nice and cool. So, somewhere yes. where so the I, heat that can be used. Uh, yeah, I yeah. jumped on the Drobo bandwagon uh, uh, probably along with Ron back in the original days and I had a, just a four-bay unit, which actually worked really well for me for several years and then um, i started hearing a lot of scare stories about people losing all the data and i'd switched to mac at this point and the drobo was an old usb one it was wicked slow so i uh, jumped to owc and this four bay thunder bay has been sat on my desk now for i don't know how many years eight years perhaps completely wow. reliable and in fact i uh, i had i was looking at uh, upgrading the drives and some questions relating to the drive matching and i sent a note to the support guys and they got back to me and said you realize your drives are currently two years past their sort of mean time to failure you probably want to look at replacing those and I had no errors whatsoever but i replaced all four drives last year and it was super simple super well not quick but simple no problems whatsoever and i, I just love this unit it's great totally reliable for me how's, how's the expense on that when you have to replace like all the tires um, at the same well, time I mean, drives are getting so cheap. I think I spent about 400 bucks for four, I think eight terabyte or 16 terabyte drive. I think eight terabyte drives. Okay. That's, yeah, that's and, uh, wow. I mean, it's not over, over the 10 years they're going to live or whatever. That's yeah. not a big deal. I just bought a lot of drives. So I can tell you right now, you can get a 20 terabyte drive if you look hard, like a, like a good one that that is designed for a box like this for about 400 bucks you can get a 16 terabyte refurbished which i would never suggest you do um exos drive for maybe 200 but for about 250 you can get a new 16 terabyte exos drive and, th and you can those start are out with two, cheap. you can start out with two drives right 
Yeah, uh, yeah, you can. But you know, if you get a a, a four bay box, then then what? Like how RAID five works is is that basically that fourth drive is your redundancy. If you only have two, then then one is almost basically a mirror of the other. But if you go to four, then you get three drives worth of capacity with the fourth drive being your your backup to the oh, other three drives. That's that's very so, Drobo ish actually. <clears throat> Yeah, wait. Raid five yeah. works like Drobo, but it's yeah, you, it's not as flexible. No, I mean you can hot replace one drive at a time quite happily, yeah. and it'll just rebuild in the background, same as Drobo. Mm -hmm. So we've wildly cleared up the uh, the, the the very confusing conversation about backups, haven't we? <laughs> okay, can we can we can we can we can we please talk about drones? <laughs> You've been waiting, yes, yes, Rob. I've been just waiting. waiting patiently for this. I want to know about drones because, quite frankly, I've I've gotten into drones, but I've got a basic license. I've got a two forty nine gram uh, drone because up here in Canada, well, if you want to do anything, you either need to get your advanced license and and pretty much be monitored on every move that you make, or you take a two. 249 gram mini drone and you can fly pretty much anywhere so i've now that the dji mini 3 has come out it's got a great sensor ish and it's small it's light it's cheap that's all i use but i want to know more what else is out there <laughs> what's better bigger where what am i going to buy next and more expensive i know who wants to start this off so what, yeah. who's going to recommend Rob's upgrade from a mini to a? Well, so I'm going the opposite way. I've, uh, I started with a Mavic Air, which was great fun to begin with, but the camera was rubbish on it, more or less, and, and for low light photography. And I upgraded to an Air 2S recently, well, a year ago, and it's fantastic, but I'm about to not downgrade, buy an extra drone. And I'm looking to get a mini purely for the 249 gram limit. Uh, there's yep. a fighting chance I'll be in Canada next year. And I thought, oh, if I could do that, I don't have to set any more exams. So, mm -hmm. so um, I I moved into drones the very first time. It was probably in 2009. And I bought a drone that carried a GoPro. And it was about, it was actually just a little bit ahead of the Phantom 1, you know, the original Phantom. And uh, I could not fly the damn thing. Uh, it, because there was no GPS hold and I had never flown one before and it kept crashing and I set it all aside and said, I'm done with this. This is stupid. And I got back in when the Phantom 2 about probably four years later came out and I, I got one of those just for a little bit and I kept having friends that had them fly away because that was a common problem with that really? drone for a oh, while. Really? And and my my next real drone that I got is a bot the Inspire One when it came out. And um, and then I also ended up with a Phantom 3 Professional as my backup to the Inspire One. Um, then I went to, uh, I, I, I was, I'm always chasing megapixels and light sensitivity with these things. And I, I mean, we'll get into that where I am now, but but I, I ended up buying the Matrice M 600 pro that was the big hex that came out that used six batteries from dji and I, that's actually what i i moved from canon as my camera company to sony at that point because the a7r2 could shoot 4k video and it was very small compared to the 1dx mark ii which was out that could also shoot 4K video, but it literally weighed twice as much. And so hmm. I, I, I like, I, I kept, a, I had a 70 Mark II as my sports and fast action camera. And then I had my, my landscape and, and stuff. It, I had the, the A7R2 for things where I didn't worry about the focus so much and, and I could manually focus or, 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 you know, sort of focus my Canon lenses through an adapter and uh, that that got me moved over. But I went from that to then um, I waited when the Inspire 2 X7 camera came out. I bought the Inspire 2 setup and I kind of I mean, I got the, all the lenses, I even got the Laowa lens that was the little nine millimeter lens. So you got a 14 millimeter with a crop sensor that was in the uh, 
inspire too because i love low light still photography from the air that's my favorite thing mm -hmm. to do and um and then i i, I actually sold my inspire 2 package in um and and i also have a whole nother series of drones that i i i, I mean right now i own six so um <laughs> but the 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 Inspire 2 I sold in November because I bought the Airpeak S1 from Sony in um, it, like literally the day it was released. And uh, I've kind of felt like I'm a little bit of a beta tester with that thing the whole time. I mean, honestly, it probably wasn't ready for pri prime time when they released it, which is unusual for Sony. Um, but Drew, let's, uh, nobody... Let's, let's, uh just to let people know that air peak maybe it's just because i didn't know about it but uh air peak is sure. dude, that's the one that's uh carrying your full it's a mirrorless yes right but it's a yes, full and frame or a good camera i see it here i see it here for nine thousand dollars yeah well <laughs> the drone's nine thousand and that comes with <laughs> the drone and that's a set of batteries and the charger and uh the remote that mm -hmm. you still have to have an iPad or an iPhone. It only like mm -hmm. the only software for it is, is Mac or, or iOS based. They don't have an Android version um, yet. And, and then it, that doesn't give you the gimbal. So you have to buy the gimbal on top of that. It's another about 2,500 bucks, I think. And that oh, the gimbal nice. is, is from Grimsey. So it gives you a Gramsci gimbal as well that I don't use for anything else. It's specifically designed to work for the air peak with the attachment that goes on to the bottom of it. Yeah, Rob. So with this drone, like, isn't this Sony's first real drone? Yeah, it is. Like that's, that's a quite a big price tag to come up uh, to put onto like their first product and quite an ambitious product to come out like straight out of the gate it'd be like um oh i don't know it'd be like someone saying hey i'm gonna make an electric car and i'm gonna make a luxury sports car just as my first car right and i'm gonna try uh, to we know somebody who did like that. tesla did for example <laughs> the, here, here's the thing though I, I mean i'll tell you the things that are wrong with this drone the drone has connectivity on it out of the box that is literally like a dji wi-fi drone like I could lose connection. Like I'm here. I've spent fifteen thousand dollars. I've got twenty thousand dollars when I, you know I'm flying my A1, and I've got a three thousand yeah. dollar, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollar lens on it. It's all in the air, and I'm losing connection while I can still hear it, right? Yeah. And I'm like, what the? So the very first thing I did because I've been doing this long enough, and I back before the rules were what they were. I got a ton of hours chasing my kids on mountain bikes. They were riding for the national intercollegiate mountain biking associate, you know, for the high school kids. And so they were, they were doing a five mile loop and I would follow them with the inspire one or the Matrice M 600 pro around the whole loop. And so I had these boosted antennas and blaze orange drones and stuff like that. So I could fly them really far away. So I was like, I know how to deal with this. And I got a, um, there's a booster that's out there that's from Alien Tech and it's called Alien Tech Duo 2. And it makes it so that now I can fly the Sony drone about a mile away. And that'll, that's plenty for me. That, that's fine. It's still line of sight. I can still see it. I can <clears> fly <throat> it and it works. But before it's, it's like, it's, you know, it doesn't even work. And it's interesting because right now they're releasing the Inspire 3, just got announced. And we're, we're going to see that. And I have a lot of people that are like, are you going to get one? I mean, that camera store called me that sold me the, the Airpeak. And I told them, no, I'm not getting one. Because here's the thing is the drone might be better. I mean, DJI does magic things with, with image transmission, with OcuSync and, and controllability. I mean, I think it should be illegal. You can fly the damn thing. If you're out in the desert, you could fly it eight miles away from you. I mean, it's crazy that we're supposed to only fly it as far as you can see it. And you could fly this thing so far away. It's like illegal. And you see people abusing that all the time. And we are going to have to talk about what's going to come into play really quick. That'll make it so that that doesn't work anymore for people. And those that are not flying legally are going to be in big trouble soon. 
Um, but but the 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 Inspire Two, I mean, the Inspire Three isn't even interesting to me because the one thing I know is that no matter what DJI does, they are not going to match the camera that is on the Air Peak. No matter what, it just can't. It, it's not going to work. The glass and the camera on the Air Peak are better than anything DJI can think about. I thought the Air Peak carried your but, your Sony mirrorless. That's why. Yeah, yeah. that is why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's just the before main, you scare yeah. people too much more, because you haven't mentioned any equipment costing less than about five grand, I think, we should probably yeah. point out that it is possible to get decent images out of a drone that costs less than 2,000 bucks. Yes. Admittedly, not as good as you would get if you're flying a Sony, but good enough for most people, myself included. No. Yeah. And, and Rob, you're asking, and I mean, Dave has an Air 2S, right? Yeah, I've I, the Air 2S just went on sale, and the Air 2S is an amazing drone to move up from a Mini 2. Um, and they they just dropped the price about like the lowest price that it's ever been on Amazon is is what it is now. They just dropped it, I think, another two hundred or one hundred and fifty dollars US, and and that's a great drone. The problem with the Air 2S, and I have one. That's my when I travel, I travel with my Mavic 3 Cine. And my backup is the Air 2S. The problem with the Air 2S is it does not have a mechanical shutter and it or does an not aperture. have an aperture. So you yeah. can't control the aperture. Yep. And what I would suggest more than the Air 2S, if you're a photographer and you're into this, is probably the, uh, the Mavic 3 Classic mm -hmm. that they've recently released. It doesn't have the second camera. It doesn't have the built-in terabyte of storage. It doesn't have a lot of things that you can get in the other Mavic 3s that you probably don't need. But it does have a, a micro yeah. four-thirds sensor that performs in, in low light very, I mean, shockingly well. It, it is yeah. very, it, I could get as good a picture, you know, you can't do the focal length differences that you can with the interchangeable lens, but I could get a, as good a picture almost with that Mavic 3 Cine that I've got as I could with Inspire 2. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, the, the, the Mavic 3 uh, looks like a, an excellent upgrade from where I am just now, purely because of the aperture. Um, that's the one thing that annoys me about the, the lower priced drones with the fixed aperture is that you, you get a gorgeous, uh, say, sunset scene and the sun's in the frame and all you get is a big old bright blob there's no way of doing yeah. any kind of starburst or any that kind of thing because you can't shut the aperture down the um, drones are yeah, that, the drones are along the are along that that path of most things like do you remember what was the first camera phone anybody here used i mean mine was about 400 oh pixels wide and 300 pixels high or something yeah and yeah. all the all the way up to a few years ago iphones i think they're just amazing for what they are now but mm -hmm. a few years ago I used to just describe it as, well, the iPhone is a good camera as long as the conditions are great, then then use it. And I think drones are at that level now. Uh, not not Drew's drones, but most of the drones that, mo that most <laughs> of us have. Consumer ones, yeah. Yeah, consumer ones. They're like that, where if you if you are if you uh, have, uh, shoot at a great time, a good time with a good mm -hmm. subject and the lighting's nice, then you're going to be you're going to be very happy probably. Oh. But then when you get into a situation like you mentioned, Dave, like uh, I, had, I had somebody shoot 360s for me as part of a larger project once. And they just it was it was a uh, um, kind of uh, shocking when you went from one 360 to another. The ones that were done with the drone were just so bad, bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that uh, it just wasn't working. And that, that was the reason I didn't get into drones. But, but that, it sounds like I'm should, getting close. I'm getting close. Yeah, you should look at it now. So that, again, from my experience with the Air 2S, the ability to use that camera in low light is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I mean, my favorite time to shoot is dusk, um, city skyline stuff, that kind of thing. And uh, it will shoot three second exposures on a stillish day, admittedly, quite happily. And they are as crisp as I need for, you know, 36 by 24 is going to process them. The Air 2S has the same sensor that the Mavic 2 Pro did. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, except they released it without the shutter and the aperture that the Mavic 2 Pro has, but it's the same sensor there. The processing is a little bit better. You can get better video out of it than you could get out of the Mavic 2 Pro, but you can't, 
the 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 difference between the Air 2S and the and the Mavic 3 series is that the that you go from a one inch sensor to a micro four third sensor. And mm -hmm. that's literally, it's, it's like three times the size. Yeah. So, so the, the, just the sensor size. So the, you know, I mean, the megapixels didn't change, but it's just like using a, a, a seven, an a seven R three. That's a 12 megapixel camera versus a, an a seven three where you've got a, 32 or 33 megapixel camera. And so each of the photo sites is smaller. So that, I mean, Dave, you got to try a Mavic 3. The, the difference in the low light capability is stunning. It's way uh -huh. better, way well, better. When I, have, when I have a couple of grand sitting around doing nothing or someone wants to spend money on my drone <laughs> yeah. pictures again, I will uh, I'll certainly be looking at one. Hey Drew, you yes. touched on you touched on something that's a real annoyance for me. On uh, with this is a lot of products, but one of the main reasons I'm looking at the now that there's the Mini Three Pro, you mm -hmm. can get a dedicated remote with it that doesn't require an iPhone, which to me is a very valuable. I'm just so sick and tired yeah. of always connecting <clears throat> my phone to all these different things. Yes. Um, so that's my that's my two cents on which one to get. Yeah, but that remote works with a whole bunch of the different drones in the range, though as well it does it it mm -hmm. it works with like that was my next like question. So, and i've got i've mm -hmm. got the rc pro instead of just the rc and so it has a higher resolution it has more battery life it, it but it costs like almost three times as much it's about a thousand dollars versus about 300 bucks for the smaller one and i i think if the smaller one was out the cheaper one when i bought mine i probably would have been happy with it um and, and I would suggest that anybody gets one. It's just simpler to have that. Mm -hmm. um, there is no integrated remote like that for the, the bigger drones, um, unfortunately. So, okay. Yeah, Rob. Hey, quick question. So, you know, we talked about the sensor size being one thing that uh, our listeners should be considering when they're buying, buying the drones. Now, I understand that with drones, you do... Well, I do mostly uh, photos, and I've slowly started being asked to do video. And then I got asked to do these vertical videos for reels and stories. And the nice thing about the Mini 3 is that, yes, it will do these vertical videos. But yeah. I guess my question is going to be, with the drones, is there going to be much difference in terms of, like, is this a better drone for, like, photos and this one's better for video? Are sort there better of. video drones? Yeah. Well, sort of, sort of. But here, here's the thing is like, if you get the Mavic 3 Classic, it doesn't. So, so starting with the Inspire 2 with the X7, you could buy that drone with or without the ProRes and Cinema DNG licenses. And so the, the <laughs> X7 on the Inspire 2 could shoot ProRes RAW and cinema dng which is awesome in 5.2k um no hmm. 6.2k uh, um oh, wow. the 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 mavic 3 cine has one of the, the differences are is it comes with the pro rc pro it also comes with um the cinema D i mean not cinema dng but it, it comes with the apple prores license built into it and it'll shoot Apple ProRes in 5.2K. Let me see if I'm remembering that right. No, it's it's 6.3. So I'm getting them backwards. The the um, Inspire with the X7 would shoot 5.2, and the and the uh, Mavic 3 Cine will shoot 6.3. I believe that's right. But you can get um, Apple ProRes RAW off of the Mavic that way, and I'm sure that the my guess is that the new inspire 3 that we don't know all the specs but we will in about a week will um only have apple prores raw my guess is that they won't even allow you to buy it without um an apple prores raw, raw license the um what i shoot with is shooting you know whatever the a7r5 or the a1 will shoot it so it'll shoot 8k video with either of those, the new um, Inspire 3 will shoot 8K video as well. And I'm sure it's Apple ProRes Raw 8K, and they're just paying for the license. Yeah. 
Okay, so I guess then going forward then, what's happening is that all these drone makers are going to be equally weighting the value of photos and videos. So if you're getting these newer drones, they should be able to do a decent job of both, which is which is in, great. In the I kind of drones that we're talking to, they have differentiated the product line and you can go with the Matrice series. And mm -hmm. I mean, they, it, DJI's had a 48 megapixel flying camera for quite a while, but it, it it's designed to do mapping on a Matrice M300, which none of us with what we do with photography and videography, none of us would ever buy that drone. It's not built mm. for it. It's built for industrial uses and law enforcement uses it and stuff like that. So it's, and I mean, it can carry all kinds of different payloads, different cameras and things like that, that we would never be interested in. So they, they do I differentiate guess it's like, the product line. I guess that's like the, uh, the, I saw the ones where, uh, actually, you know what? I didn't even see it on DJI's site. I saw this YouTuber or TikToker or Instagrammer that had the first, the FPV goggles on and they're flying this crazy drone with all the bumpers, like up and down obstacle courses and through tunnels and industrial places. And I realized that's cool, but I'm never going to do that. <laughs> Dave, you have so, something. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah there's, Drew was talking originally about uh, quadcopter that was very difficult to fly and being put off drones at that point. And it's probably really important to mention that whereas like a racing FPV drone takes a lot of skill flying it, what we're talking about are basically cameras that happen to fly rather than drones that happen to have a camera. Yeah. And mm -hmm. from my experience with DJI, and I'm sure a bunch of the other consumer and photography targeted drones, they are ridiculously simple to fly. It doesn't take any dexterity whatsoever, really, to keep them in, in the air. You let go of the controls, they stay there. Um, yeah. You're basically <laughs> just telling it where to position it in three space, and you take your pictures. And it's I a think totally the... different experience. So if, if, you, if you've flown an FPV drone, camera drones are totally different. Well, I think the, I, the benefit, the benefit of, I saw someone doing a demo of, is it called Avada that has the mm -hmm. yeah. uh, first person is FPV first person viewer, right? Yep. Uh, remember not everybody listening is as nerdy as we are. Uh, so <laughs> the, what I saw was uh, they did a demo of guess what? A real estate video using one of those. And the advantage was that he could go all the way through and around and up and down through the house and never be seen in the video where instead of uh, trying to fly that, I, I suppose you could do it if you're good but I don't know. Do you want to risk knocking things over in the house? I'm not quite sure, but um, it seemed like a good use for it. For the FPV versus the little looking in the iPhone to get your, uh, to get that uh, perspective. I don't know. That, but, do I have that? The, yeah. But the Avada and the DJI FPV drone, which was their first one that they came out with, give you kind of the FPV experience. But if you talk to anybody that races drones, and I have an FPV drone back here and I'm not a great pilot, but I can fly it. Um, it, it, it and, and it carries like a, a GoPro 10, Hero 10, you know. Um, but, but the Avada and the DJI FPV drone um, still can do a GPS hold. Or uh, I, I, you don't, if you let go of it, it depends on the mode that you're in. But if you let go of it, it does not f fly, you know, it, if it, it like, with the FPV it's not drone, like a car. If you're going, yeah, if you're going forward <laughs> and you don't tell it to stop and you don't control it, it will continue to go forward with the momentum until it runs out of momentum. If you let go of the sticks, it will fall on the ground. If you if you don't if you're not on the throttle, it's either on or off. It's not mm -hmm. hover. You know, it, it's just huh. like whoosh, whoosh, and you just mm -hmm. have to get used to making it so that so that you provide enough throttle to give it the necessary thrust mm -hmm. to make it stay in the air. And, and yes, th yes. it's a, it's a different animal completely. It's more like flying a, a model aircraft that I used to fly when I was a kid where you actually have to control the, the um, flight surfaces yourself. Yes. You're actually piloting mm -hmm. the thing rather than just telling it where to go. You don't have to know what an aileron is to fly a drone, right? Well, it doesn't have an aileron, <laughs> but you have to know about <laughs> thrust and pitch and yaw and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. All right, so there's a lot of stuff about this FPV, the uh, getting into the different types of drones. So where do you learn to do all this stuff? 
I think Drew is uh, so deep in, into this that I think the getting the getting started part, I would love to hear from Dave. <laughs> I can give you the consumer kind of hobbyist approach, I suppose. Okay, so after you've found your drone, and there's umpteen choices these days that don't necessarily cost you an absolute fortune. Um, if you're in the US, now the rules vary from country to country, so this only applies to my experience in the US. You have to register your drone if it weighs more than 250 grams. Right. Um, you, the place to go is the FAA Drone Zone. If you look it up in Google, you'll find it, and the, the uh, URL will be in the show notes. You register your drone, to, and you have to get a sticker put on the drone with the FAA registration number on it. Um, if you're planning to just fly it for fun, you also have to taste, take a test called Trust, which is just basic safety information. You can probably do it in 10 minutes flat. If you've ever flown models before, you can probably do, do it without studying anything. If you haven't flown models before, you probably want to go and read one of the study guides, which will take you half an hour maximum. It's a very simple test. I think it's valid for it's either two or five years. I'm not sure which. Um, it doesn't cost you anything to take it. Two years, yeah. Um, once you've done that, you can legally fly in, in uh, uncontrolled airspace in the US up to 400 feet. As long as you're within line of sight of your drone, you cannot fly out of line of sight legally. Um, so that's the easiest way of getting started as someone just planning to play with a drone and get an idea of how it works. If you want to move to the next level and do anything even vaguely commercial, and there are arguments or there are uh, different interpretations of commercial, but generally speaking, if you're offering a pictures for sale, you'd be commercial. Uh, you'd have to then look at the FAA Part 107 test, which lets you become a licensed commercial drone pilot. And it's a bit more work. Um, I got mine a couple of years back. I think I probably did about 12 to 15 hours of studying for it. And you have to go to an FAA um, licensed test site to take the test. And it cost you 175 bucks and it lasts for two years as well. But with that, it slightly expands what you're allowed to do with your drone. Uh, the height limits change slightly. Um, flying in the vicinity of buildings, flying at night, and things become more possible. And uh, but that gives you the right to sell your services as a drone drone pilot. And that's pretty much where I am just now. After the time limit, do you have to take the test again, or do yeah. you just uh, re-register? You, you've got to do a re uh, retest. It's a reoccurrence mm -hmm. test, and. Yeah, you know, it's just like pilots. They basically mm -hmm. give you a FAA, a FAA pilot's license. There's different versions of it, depending on if you want to be a sport pilot or a regular pilot or a balloon pilot or a glider pilot or or a drone pilot. And so every two years, you've got to redo it. And okay. the test is easier the second time around. It's about 40 questions. I've renewed mine yep. three times now. So mm -hmm. I've had it for seven Mine's years. Up in September. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not that difficult, but it does involve a bit of work. You've got to know about weather patterns, uh, reading charts, uh, a bunch of stuff that probably doesn't seem directly related to flying a drone, but it's just the way the FAA works. And yeah, they want you that? to stay out of the uh, out of the way of airplanes. Mm -hmm. Really, that's yeah, ninety percent of the what thing. they're telling, telling you how it's, to do. It's mostly safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, cool. Hey, and then the other thing before we uh, um, before we kind of wrap up here is uh drew you mentioned something that was important that there's a, a change coming to well yes. it uh, was important you tell us in september in the united states um there's uh, going to be a regulation that comes about that's called remote id and what remote id does is it makes it so that law enforcement or this is the part that i don't like the general public can go oh there's a drone flying right over there. Who's flying it? And I, I think that's a great idea um, in the sense that, you know, every car has a license plate on it, right? So this is like a license plate for the drone. So if some idiot is doing something stupid, the police or the FAA or the police could, could turn you into the FAA and say, this guy was flying over a park full of people or over a stadium. Right. We've seen a couple of those where people have flown over NFL games at yeah. this point. Once remote ID goes into place in, into effect, they can tell who it is and they can trace it back to you. But not only can they trace it back to you, they can tell where you are flying from real time. 
So somebody can say, oh, where's the GPS location of the pilot right now? And they can come and get you. And so that that's in September. And it, it's interesting because there are a couple of remote ID little modules that you will be able to attach to drones that don't have remote ID capability already built into them. And most of DJI's current products do. People are signing a petition to try to get the Phantom 4 Professional version 2 to have remote ID because it's just a programming issue on that one. Um, but, but everything since then basically is most, almost everything I think is remote ID capable in the DJI lineup. Um, my, my Sony drone, my Skydio 2 drone, they all are remote ID capable and they have that built in. But if you have something that's not, you can buy a little remote ID module that you hook to the drone that will broadcast the drone's location and your location as the pilot to anybody that has an app that can re read the. I mean, you will be able to literally have the app on your phone. And so Aunt Mary can look up who's, the, who's flying the drone over there, which means that people will not get away with being anonymous and breaking the rules anymore. Will people get away with reporting something that's uh, perfectly uh, normal, legal, and uh, accepted, but they still well, complain? You know what I'm talking about here, right? <laughs> Someone's going to complain no matter what. Yes, yeah. and it's law enforcement that we have to worry about more than the FAA. Like, like, you can turn people in that are doing really obviously illegal, stupid stuff. The FAA will not do anything about it as it stands currently because they don't, they can, they're like, I don't know for sure who was flying that thing. Hmm. Right. And, and so they, they rely on evidence. And if they don't, if they cannot tell who the pilot that was flying the drone illegally was just based on the footage that shot, then they, they won't do anything. Remote ID is going to change all of that because now they can say that was you. And you could say, well, it was my kid. And, you know, I mean, that might make, a little bit of a difference, but you're it. it no, it's going to change everything. Yeah, and they're going to they'll give you an automatic fine to your FedNow account if you don't know what it is. Look it up. So let's move on to um, YouTube picks. Now that we've scared everybody, who said go yes. get a drone. Here's how to do it, and then you're going to get caught by some. Uh, get off my lawn is now. Don't fly that drone, right? I, I'm excited right? about this. I, I think it's going to be a good thing for the industry as a whole. So I, I like the fact they'll catch people who are doing the wrong thing. But my worry is people getting reported for doing what other people perceive to be wrong, even when it's totally yeah. illegal. But that's another discussion, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, definitely. Okay. So let's move on here then. Uh, so we have this new section. And we brought this in because, well, let's face it, we are in the age of the internet. You're probably listening to this because you downloaded this podcast from the internet. I don't know how else you would have gotten it. We're not sending out LPs or CDs or or tapes to anybody. So, and obviously you're not on the radio. Now, what we always heard back in the day, back in, a, I guess, in my kids' days, it was, well, if you don't know something, Google it. And that's recently changed to being, hey, if you don't know something, YouTube it. So, this section is... What are you, 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 to, you, to, tubing? That almost worked. <laughs> All right. We got to keep working on that. Okay. <laughs> I do. I do. All right. Pap, let's start with you. You got one here. Uh, yeah, let me go real quick. Uh, I was kind of holding this back. It's a great Photoshop learning channel called Flurn with PH, PH, L E A R N. And if you're, so if you're somebody that uses Photoshop a bit, but doesn't know the, I mean, heavy lifting of it. This is a great place to go. Um, and uh, he'll take you through extremely detailed and professional ways of handling a lot of different Photoshop things. So uh, since we're going long, I don't need to go into it too much. Uh, there's going to be a link for all these in the show notes. So who wants to go next? Yeah, Dave, go for it. I'm next on the list. Um, okay, I kept mine topical. We're talking about uh, drones and part 107 exams. There are lots of people who will try and sell you very expensive uh, classes for studying for part 107. And I'll be perfectly honest, you don't need to do that stuff. The FAA produced a, a PDF guide that's very good, even if it's slightly out of date. And there's tons of stuff on YouTube that will answer most of the questions you want. And the, the video that I found the most useful when I was cramming the last week before my test 
was a one hour, 45 minute video by Tony Northrop, which goes through everything you need to know for part 107 in literally an hour and a half. And watch it a couple of times. It's probably likely you'll get through the test just by watching the video a couple of times. But mm -hmm. use that and the FAA guide and you'll be, you'll be golden. So the link to Tony's is, video is in there. Both of these are a little dated at this point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They've changed some things um, like, like uh, you don't have to get a daylight waiver anymore and yep. some stuff, but it, it gives you 90%. It'll get you 90% of the way there. So that, yeah. that's a great and video. By the way, if, on, Dave, get, on Dave's recommendation, I checked out that uh, I, I like Tony Northrop already, but I checked out his, that course you mentioned, and um, they've got a 30 minute version that goes I was about super to say fast. That. Yeah. <laughs> super <laughs> fast. Got, They've got a concise version now you can watch just before getting into your test. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as Drew said, be careful. There's two rules that have changed since the both the study guide and the, the video were produced. One relates to night flying and then one relates to flight over people. So if you get those questions, you might get them wrong if you just rely on those two resources. But we all know you're going to go back and read the actual part one of seven regulations as well. Well, so, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> yeah. exactly. All right, Drew, what's I yours? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you guys are all doing, you know, topical, and that's great. Uh, I think that's really important. Not I, required. I, le I learned <laughs> so much from, I mean, really from Tony Northrup, and I love Flern. When I get stuck with a Photoshop problem, I, I, that's one of my resources for sure. But I'm from Utah, and um, Matt's off-road recovery is a blast to watch, and it's it's a uh, group down in Southern Utah that goes and gets them out. They, they uh, <laughs> have these majorly modified Jeeps or he built uh -huh. a wrecker that will, you know, this huge vehicle that has 54 inch tires that will go and pull a, you know, motor home out of a, a red rock uh, trail kind of thing. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy stuff, but it's, it's just a, I, you know, I, I watch that instead of TV. I yeah, see. I see yeah. it here. You're saying recovery, <laughs> meaning recovering cars that are beyond yep. stuck. <laughs> this looks yeah, cool. It, okay, I'm just looking at it. Now. It's a it's a towing company. Is really what okay. it is. But it's it. They run out of Hurricane Utah. That's right next to St. George down in the southern end of the state. And um, I I like it because I have gotten myself stuck several times. And uh, you know I've got a truck now that has a three and a half inch lift and big tires and it has. Uh, I have all my own recovery gear and I've got a, a big steel bumper on the front of it with a worn winch in it and lights and the whole thing. And I've taken a couple of classes on getting myself out if so I could self recover because I was really lucky um, in a couple of places. Now the iPhone 14 has satellite connection, right? But before that, I always carried a, a a uh, radio that would connect to the satellite so I could text somebody in a dire emergency. I never had to use it, but oh, always this worries. Be, this will be a fun, bit. this will be a fun one to binge sometime. Yeah. <laughs> oh my fun. God. What I'm about, just trying to think you know? it's like, like Utah does not seem like one of those places. I want to go take a road trip down now. <laughs> you do. Oh you yeah. Want to go to Utah. Well, oh, it's worth oh, it. Yeah. You they get a bad rap. There's a lot of, there's a lot of great things about it too. So. Rob, when you decide to come to Utah, Tell me, and I've I've got a, a truck that's set up for it. I mean, when when everybody's coming out, Mary Beth Kaczynski, who's my friend from Chicago, who's an amazing astral landscape and Aurora landscape photographer. She's she's incredible. She's going to bring her Jeep, so we'll have two vehicles in in our crew, and everybody else. We're, between those two vehicles, we're going to get down. I mean, we're going to go out to two weep it's the grand canyon overlook and it's just a brutal trail for about two hours and we're going to go out there and we're going to go do a zion's canyon overlook and we're going some crazy places but we've been some crazy uh, places drew is in the club uh rob i see your pick is going to be topical again Yes, it is. And you know what? It's because Boring. because you already picked Flurn <laughs> that I had to find something else. And I came across these guys, uh, the Photoshop training channel. And yeah, good stuff yeah. there. No, yeah. they're they've got some good stuff. And it's it's nice. It's nice to see the community coming out, everybody like sharing all their Photoshop tips and tricks and hacks and and helping out. It's helping push Photoshop sales through the roof. And so hopefully they keep <laughs> making it better. 
<laughs> right. Let us let us right. uh, shoot shoot us messages, uh, listeners, uh, if you like topical picks or completely random off topic picks, like we do sometimes. But I think it's open either way. Whatever whatever is getting you excited that week, let's share it. You know, or that month, let's share it. But what do you say we wrap up? Uh, we as we like to say around here, cue the music and um, say uh, first of all, thanks again, Photomatics for sponsoring. If you have any interest in uh hdr hey and by the way if you think it's a a bad look that's not what hdr is and you can you can say what do you mean ron and i'll answer you um <laughs> it's a way of solving a problem is what it is but let's uh thanks um photomatic skin for sponsoring rob thanks for being my co-host in this endeavor that we've uh, created here and uh guys um let's let uh, uh drew want a one last quick chance to let people know where to find you or, or anything you want to Share oh, sure. Um, on Instagram, and I'm old, so I don't do a lot of Instagram. Um, although, you know, kids are all on TikTok and everything now as well. But I, uh, my uh, my Instagram is travels from Utah at travels from Utah. Or you can find me on my website. I, my, I, I haven't been as good in the last three months in uploading because I'm transitioning to a different platform. But it's Still works. Everything still works. I just don't upload as regularly as I usually do, but it's just my name. It's DrewArmstrong.com. Uh, I'm a real estate broker, and so I uh, reserved that name in 1997. So I lucked out. <laughs> I guess that helps when you're old, right? So <laughs> Dave Time was the, on Dave, our side. <laughs> Dave, the one that does not have the, um, the one, just your name yeah. URL. Dave Wilson right. photography. What where else can we, we send to people? Dave Wilson find you? photography everywhere else. So Instagram. Okay. I see Twitter's different. Twitter's DA Wilson, but everything else is Dave Wilson photography these days. Yeah, check it's out Dave. Will, check out Dave's work. Every you know, he's all uh, modest, but uh, no need to be. Rob, what do you want to share? Let's uh, let's uh, let everybody go here. Well, you know, uh, like I said in, in, earlier today, I've put out a course. It is online. It's ready to go. It's at robmoroto.com. You can actually, there's an option there where you can actually buy Photomatics with the course, which is a great deal. I don't, I don't know. It's it's a, it's doing pretty well there. And aside from that, you know, I am on YouTube. I am on, uh, I am on Instagram. I am on Facebook. You'll be able to find me at Rob Moroto. And that's about it. And Pep. I'm the one here, uh, not really promoting anything specific unless, you know, somebody in the Bay Area. I'm a photographer in the Bay Area, ronpepper.com. I promise I'll update that darn website soon. But uh, doing a lot, I'm uh, promoting, building up the real estate photography business. Other than that, our pepper on Instagram. All right. And that's and it. That, let's, let's, say, let's say get out and Maybe. go shooting and uh, quick adios.